skill and music. Okay. Here's fine. Okay, so I'm not going to go. I don't need uh, to go back. We're just. I just had a question. On the minutes? Last well, minutes? Maybe a bit of a procedural thing. Um, that's for you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, the February meeting, when does it get posted? It, it gets posted because it's annual meeting. We go annual meeting to annual meeting. So okay. those minutes will be, be brought forward at the annual meeting. That's why these are our December minutes. So at the annual meeting, the minutes that were brought forward were last year's annual meetings. Mr. Mm -hmm. Chair, if I can just move up to um, maybe the yep. person off uh, screen. My eyes are not what they used to be. Well, it is a long way back here. Do <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we need all the lights on? I mean, it's, good. it's just that. You um, flip the race there. What do you want to flip them? Oh, to? I think there. To the top two. There. Probably the top two you just flip down. And if that's what you see, I'm fine. Okay, there. I think we're good. Thank you. Thank you. I think it's just my older eyes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. 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 You had a mover and a seconder, oh. and we haven't approved them. We haven't uh, had uh, all in favor. Uh, Could I get the mover and the seconder? I'm sorry. Uh, Adam was sure. one. Willie, Willie moved and Adam seconded. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm good. Now. And all in favor then of those minutes? And that's carried. Do we have the adoption of today's agenda? Can I have a mover to approve the adoption of today's agenda, please? Miriam, seconded by Joan. Uh, anyone with any concerns with today's agenda or anything on it? Again, all in favor? That's carried. And we'll go down to item number seven, which is our Gander Alaska Forest Recreational Users, well, recreational update. And then the staff report attached. We didn't have the staff. And Ed, Ed will be doing a presentation. It's on the screen. Okay, Ed, I guess we'll turn it over to you. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> All right, so first I'm going to talk to you today about our uh, winter trail system. We were able to open all of the snow and snowshoe and ski trails on February 14th this year. That was delayed uh, due to some logging efforts that were blocking the, uh, the access points in the central forest. Uh, fortunately, we've had uh, several large snowfall events, um, also followed by several melts, uh, which, which is fortunate though, we were able to maintain and keep maintain a solid back packed snow ski trail system this year. So that allowed us, our staff, to uh, do a quick turnaround after those melt seasons or melt situations. Unfortunately, due to some uh, COVID-19 uh, sicknesses, uh, there was a period of time when uh, the trail grooming was reduced on the ski trails. Uh, we also encountered uh, some increase in off-trail snowmobile access. Uh, we have worked with the Ontario Federation of Snowmobile Clubs and we will be attempting to address this uh, further next season with the insulation of fences and signage and doing some social media announcements. Uh, Off-trail riding is a major problem with the Ontario Federation across uh, the province of Ontario. So they're, uh, they're familiar with the situation and the problems that uh, it can cause. As of uh, for May 1st, 2023, GRC is planning to reopen the majority of the trails uh, within the entire central forest. Uh, the majority meaning at least 95% of the trail system that existed uh, prior to the May 21st, 2022 storm. Uh, to identify the trail network, we're utilizing GIS, our GIS quick capture and traditional GRCA mapping. As part of our recovery efforts, PRCA has contracted two companies to work uh, in support of our staff to clear 
major blockages caused from the direct storm of May 2021. And we are focusing that effort with the contractors in the West Forest. So the uh, total amount of working days will be 30 days for those contractors with approximately 720 worker hours. The uh, majority of the work will take place in April. I, yes, that's it there. Sorry. The trail maintenance agreement, we uh, are still in discussions with the Ontario Federation of Trail Riders and uh, staff fully expects to offer an agreement to the trail, Ontario Federation of Trail Riders in the coming weeks. And there are still opportunities for other organizations if they're interested in to enter into a trail maintenance agreement with the GRC. So the volunteer trail maintenance program has been developed and uh, we've been accepting volunteer applications and we had to extend that, uh, that deadline due to several factors. And we've received over 35 interested volunteer applications. The GRCA staff is setting up a training date prior to authorizing volunteers access in the property to do volunteer work. Volunteers will be assisting the GRCA through light duty single track clearing. Um, volunteers will have uh, duties such as removal of smaller trees, cutting debris that's left behind from contractors and doing some light duty uh, vegetation encroachment clearing. Thank you, that's it for me. Okay, thank you, Ed. Uh, questions for Ed? Uh, Miriam, I see you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, through you to the presenter. Uh, the volunteers, uh, uh, shall I put the word out or, you know, uh, in a report at my council or, or, or have you got those people fairly organized and, and uh, you've got your list? I don't know if you can hear me. Did you hear that, Ed? Do you want further recruits, in other words? <laughs> uh, yes, I did hear that question uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, we have, I believe the deadline for this round of volunteers has already come and, come and gone, but we always encourage anybody that's interested in volunteering with the GRCA at the Ganaraska Forest to submit a volunteer application. Okay. Uh, so yes, please spread the word. Oh, good. And through you, Mr. Chair, um, there is training on April 1st that they're going to be, and as long as they've got their own PPE, if they wanted to submit an application, that would be great. Okay, did everyone hear that? Yeah. Any further questions for Ed? I have one, Ed. I noticed you mentioned 95%. Is, is there 5% that's, that's not that's going to be hard to open up. What's the reason behind not having 100%? Uh, just, once again, for you, Mr. Chair, uh, the, uh, the answer to that question is several trails uh, traditionally ran into private property or encroached upon private property. So okay. the staff is identifying those trails and uh, removing those conflicts. Oh, I see. So there's a bit more time because of that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Can I have a motion to receive uh, Ed's report, uh, verbal report for information purposes? Oh, Lance. Lance and Margaret, uh, all in favor? That's curious. When you have Vicky on the screen? Yes, I do. Yeah. A letter. Okay, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Squeeze my eyes to see who has <laughs> letting me. <laughs> Okay, next up we have our natural hazards presentation series in part one dealing with the shoreline hazards. And Corey, I guess you're going to take over for that. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, it will be Ken and I doing the presentation. Thank you. Yes, sorry, so, Ken. And then we'll just queue this up here and make sure everyone can see it. <clears throat> it's not just your eyes, Linda. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so, thank you, Mr. Chair. This this uh, is a presentation series that 
Ken and I uh, did to the board two years ago, actually, almost to the day. Um, and it's really just to give an overview of natural hazards that the Conservation Authority regulates under the provincial regulations. And we've got a fair number of new members, and we, we just felt it might be beneficial to, to run through this series just as a, a refresher for some and, and new information for others. Um, so just to, to give a brief outline of what I want to touch on here, we're going to give some background to where the regs came from, um, talk about natural hazards uh, as the presentation series, no, give an overview of shoreline hazards, and then um, Ken's going to help with talking about policy and technical consideration, then we'll, we'll wrap up. So as most of you know, the Conservation Authorities Act was enacted in 1946. The GRCA was the third CA in the province to, to be enacted, I think, in October of 46. Yeah, just by a couple months. <clears throat> yeah. If there's a presentation running, we can't see it. Oh. Okay, let me okay. try this. That's strange. So what, what I forgot to do, I guess, is just the screen share piece. Sorry about oh, that. Oh, you didn't screen share. You just, yes. Screen share. Here. Thank you for letting us know. Yes, thank, <laughs> thank you. you, Margaret. Okay, take two. <laughs> Can you see it now? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I see. Okay. Yes, I can. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah, the Conservation Authorities Act was enacted in '46, and the GRCA has been around since October of 1946. Uh, and this movement was largely in response to erosion and drought concerns after the, the 1930s and a lot of the erosion that happened in that period. Um, and it was determined by the province and through special studies that erosion and flooding issues are best managed on a watershed basis. And that's really why the Conservation Authorities movement has been so recognized worldwide is because it's on a watershed basis. Um, it, this, this arrangement provided the means by which the province and the municipalities could work together to join, uh, join efforts basically to form a conservation authority within a watershed area and undertake these programs at the local level for natural resource management. Uh, so the act and the corresponding regs are, are really designed to protect people and property from flooding and erosion hazards. I think a lot of folks know that flooding is the most costly natural hazard in Canada. So Ontario has been doing this for a, a lot of years and it's, it's really paying dividends. Um, so development and construction within hazardous lands is costly to, to, uh, to build, it requires maintenance. Uh, and the bottom line here is that good planning saves the taxpayers significant dollars. It's good for the economy and makes our communities more resilient, especially in the light of climate change. So the series here, we're gonna cover um, a number of different hazards. So first one here is, is shoreline uh, along the Great Lakes. And we'll be talking in, in future sessions about stream valleys, water courses, um, hazardous lands, which is a broader definition for things like unstable soils. We'll talk about wetlands and then uh, other areas that could potentially interfere with the hydrologic function of, of a wetland. And I'll turn it over to Ken if, if you can read. If I can, Ken. I'm going to screw it. Let's say that. <laughs> so, so I know that I know this. Uh, this is this comes from our regulation. So, our regulate within GRCA's regulation, each conservation authority currently has its own individual regulation. It's anticipated this year where all conservation authorities are going to go to one one regulation. But currently, as it stands. Um, Section two of our regulation in the case that no person shall develop within certain areas. And one of those areas being uh, the shoreline communities, be it the floodplain, the dynamic beach hazard, or the and the erosion hazard, plus a distance or an allowance of 15 meters inland. That just indicates our regulated area. So certainly that it, there, there are certain allowances for development within, within that. It just means that you need to get a permit if you meet that criteria as indicated here. So 
up, uh, th there's going to be a bit of a change up until recently we've considered there one, once five tests have been met flooding erosion dynamic beaches pollution and conservation of land once those tests have been met then a permit is issued uh, we will be losing pollution and conservation of land and that will be replaced with unstable soils and bedrock this is just taking a look at the at the shoreline hazard itself, um, showing how uh, showing how erosion occurs, and um, and, and certainly concerns with development on the on the tableland. So one one of the things we do look for is if there is going to be a shoreline wall proposed on on Lake Ontario that it is built appropriate. Uh, and, and will address the hazard appropriately as well. If it is some in some cases the wall may fall into the into the water, but but in some instances this is not doing um, or serving the purpose. So we do require that a shoreline engineer do the do the design appropriate to address the address the hazard. And again, this is uh, this is a house that's been built within within the hazard, um, whether that's the the floodplain or or if erosion is starting to creep up closer to the to the development itself over a period of time. And uh, here's a couple. I, I I'm pretty sure the uh, the one in the top left that's in in Lake Erie, but. Uh, a community that was originally built set back from the shoreline as a, as a result of erosion. Um, now the now the lake has come up very close to the house, and and also the the bottom right uh, showing showing the effects of erosion over a period of time and now compromising the the existing house structure. So there's a number of. Uh elements to defining flooding and erosion hazards. So we'll first look at the erosion hazard. And I know this might be hard to read for, for some folks, but um, basically the erosion hazard is, is determined by uh, looking at the 100 year flood level and then looking at the 100 year tow erosion allowance, which is essentially the amount of the tow of the slope that's gonna erode over a 100 year planning horizon. Um, once that's determined, then you can calculate a stable slope allowance, which will vary depending on the type of soil you're dealing with. If you've got shale or clay, it might be a one-to-one -one slope, horizontal to vertical. If it's sand, it might be more like three horizontal, one vertical. Um, and once you look at all components of the hazard that you would then apply a 15 meter uh, allowance onto that, which would determine the regulation limit. So erosion is real, it happens every day. Uh, and this is just an example of, of an eroding bluff in our watershed down in, in Newcastle. Um, and I know that 100 year planning horizon for erosion, when you're looking in that tow erosion rate, typically for Lake Ontario, it's, it's about a foot a year, 0.3 meters. Um, when we did our Lake Ontario shoreline management plan back in 2020, we determined we measured um, specific erosion rates along sections or reaches of the shoreline. And Newcastle came out to be the highest uh, erosion rate within our jurisdiction, which was closer to two feet a year yeah. in some parts. So you can imagine as a homeowner, when <laughs> the shoreline is just gradually getting closer, it's doing so in the order of two feet a year. So that's yeah, just something to be aware of. Uh, when we look at flooding hazards, we kind of touched on it in the previous slides about the erosion hazard, but the flooding hazard is really focused on water level and wave action. So it's looking at your 100 year lake level and then applying an allowance for wave uprush. So as your water level comes up, uh, you'll often get in big storms, you'll get a, a, a lake surge, which means the, the prevailing wind direction is actually pushing the water up in one direction. And then you've got waves on top of that. So in, in this area, I think the uh, wave up rush is in the order of two meters vertically. So, so it's a big uh, 
element that you have to take into account when you're when you're assessing uh, limits of the flood hazard. Once you define those two components, then you'd be applying a 15 meter uh, allowance to determine the limit of a regulated line. Uh, dynamic beach hazards are are kind of their own animal. <laughs> um, it's basically a, a section of sandy beach, which the sand itself is supplied by the movement of material within the lake. So um, there's offshore drift that brings sediment from different areas um, and actually it nourishes the beaches. And so if that's cut off, that can cause a lot of problems for that beach to, to basically re-nourish and, and uh, stay supplied with sediment. So the dynamic beach hazard is defined as um, looking at your 100-year water level, looking at wave uprush, but the province has said, you know, a 30-meter beach allowance for a, a dynamic beach feature is a, an appropriate distance um, because in a big storm, you'll get sections of the beach moving significantly. Um, so that degree of variability has to be encapsulated within a, an appropriate erosion hazard limit, and that's what the 30 meters is for. Once you've determined that, then you also apply the 15 meter allowance to determine the reg limit. And uh, Port Hope West Beach is an example of a dynamic beach. Uh, there's a few within the watershed, but this is probably one of the more prominent ones. I think Coburg Beach would also classify as a dynamic beach. Um, so that's just a good example. Um, and you might be asking, how do you determine the limits of these hazards? And <clears throat> If you want some really good bedtime reading, there's an 800 page document that lays yeah. out in very technical terms how you determine each of these particular hazards. So um, when we did this Lake Ontario management plan, the consultants that we retained, um, they referred to this provincial uh, documentation as guidance and how we determine these measures and these features. And they're currently doing currently same same folks are currently doing an update. Yeah. Um, so I guess there's a few slides here I just wanted to throw in. I don't want to take too much time on this, but I want to drive home the point that slope failures happen. Erosion is real. It's a it's a a process that's occurring every day. And there's some really good video and pictures from uh, Lake Erie during the 2017 and 2019 high water levels in the lakes. And uh, um, there's an example here where parts of the bluff just start um, failing and there's it's the beginning of rotational failures. And this is just an air photo of, of that spot. It's right along, I think, um, might be Highway 3 or the Talbot Trail just between St. Thomas and I think Rondo, it's, it's down that way. Um, but <clears throat> there's a short video, I'm not gonna play the whole thing, but it's a chat of Kent Council that goes out to this property and videos with his phone. Um, the extent of the start of this rotational failure. And he's in this area. I don't know if you can see my hand on the screen, but he's he's walking in this area and he's kind of looking up to the east. Um, so I'm going to see if this will play. Because if it doesn't, I have to my guy or something. <laughs> can you still see my screen? I'm just going to escape a PowerPoint for a moment and go into the browser. And I might have to reduce this. Pull this down. Yeah, I think it's this one here. So can you see that? Can you see that on screen now, Willie, Margaret? You see the all I see is the background from the report still. Okay. I am going to reshare and I will pick that screen. Okay, here we go. Can you see that now? Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Great. Thank you. Okay. So um, this is yeah Trevor Thompson, a Chatham Kent counselor, and uh, I'm going to play this. I'm not sure if you'll be able to hear it, but I'm going to um, maybe play the first minute or so. And what he's pointing out here is just the width of the cracks um, showing the start of the failure. Video. Uh, video doesn't either. Like that's 
Okay, got the sound. Okay, great. Here's the start. And there's the shoreline over there. So let's count it out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Small cracks there. Twelve. More there. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, one, two, three. Call it thirty paces to the water's edge. So what he's pointing out there is that. Those crack failures, so those lines showing the start of that rotational failure, is almost 30 meters back from the crest of the slope, which is very significant. <laughs> and you can see uh, in the top of the, the image here, just the, the rift that's formed in the, in the ground surface. This is probably uh, two to three feet here. And I think later in the video, he goes over here and it's closer to four feet. Um, so I, I won't spend the time going through the whole video, but it's just showing um, the magnitude of some of these failures that are occurring along the Great Lakes and how important it is to plan for some of these uh, hazards and, and make sure that new development is well set back uh, from, from the, the lake. So I will stop sharing that and get back into the presentation here can be frequently shocking for landowners when we, we do say your setback is, is going to be about, say, 30 meters back. And, you know, we're, we're going to require the, the, the setback for any and all development. And, uh, I mean, the, the reports reflect that, um, will reflect that setback. Uh, there is always the opportunity for a landowner to do a site-specific study if they don't agree with the report that we have, um, we have here. So they can hire their own shoreline engineer to do that assessment. And you have to remember that as the slope gets higher, you know, the further back that line is going. Um, so that's why it's quite shocking for some of those those bluff properties. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so there's also um, another video. I'm not going to play it, but it's I'll leave this link in for you to view at your your leisure. But there's a YouTube video here of. Um, a program it's only a, a five or ten minute video but it's it has part of it has an interview with the consultant that did our shoreline management plan and he gives some really uh, interesting perspectives on how we're managing um, shoreline hazards in the great lakes because all of our erosion rates are based on historical data and one of the things that came out of our shoreline management plan was that because the ice uh, the lakes don't freeze in the winter time, the way they used to, we're now getting erosion all year round, and our erosion rates are going up more than fifty percent. So we're basing our erosion rates on historical data. We haven't planned for the impacts of, of climate change, and that's something we really need to uh, wrestle with. And I'll just pass this back to Ken to, to wrap up. So there's a number of uh, there's a number of causes for slope instability. Of course, proximity of, of Development shoreline, Lake Ontario processes, um, internal seepage or groundwater coming out of the slopes, surficial runoff, uh, so the soil composition, the angle of slopes. Um, in general, all our watershed slopes are stable at an angle of at uh, three to one. Uh, natural cover: the more the more trees that are removed, and um, and, and less cover we have may exacerbate. Erosion and and certainly human uh, human activities, be it swimming pools, septic, cut and fill, uh, what have you. So uh, this this is just another example. Of, you, you saw the video of a uh, failure scarp or a rotational what a rotational failure will start to look like. You will see that land start to start to rotate away to the um, to the immediate right of the screen. Within the provincial policy statement, um, I, I will say that it, it does it does reference a provincial policy statement. That's when we're speaking to planning act applications. Um, in general, keeping development outside of hazardous land, and um, and important to note that in three one two development alteration shall not be permitted within within certain areas, and and it specifically speaks to dynamic beach hazards in this particular instance. 
within GRCA policies. Um, we, we do want to ensure that any and all new development, particularly habitable development, is located outside uh, outside the hazards. Uh, you know, where, where development currently exists within the shoreline hazard, there's no uh, no feasible alternative. There, there may be some opportunities um, for some development, typically uh, typically non-habitable development may be, uh, may be supported within certain areas, but we do try to make sure that any all development is located as far back outside of that hazard as possible. There is some opportunity for public infrastructure where it's been demonstrated there's a need to locate within that hazard. Uh, uh, of course, some aspects of public parks can go into these areas. Uh, shoreline conservation, restoration, uh, stabilization projects, and uh, driveway or uh, driveway accesses where there is no feasible or alternative viable alternative. Uh, we do try to prevent the need for additional studies. As as mentioned, we do have our shoreline report. Uh, if if the landowner wishes to. Oh, if, if they develop outside of that hazard limit as identified by the report, the report represents a worst case scenario in which staff can confidently say that you're outside of the hazard if you build outside of, outside of the hazard limit line. We wouldn't require any additional further analysis, but the landowner does. Uh, we, we will accept that the landowner can proceed with a shoreline engineer to do an analysis on, on the, uh, the shoreline to determine the um, for instance, the, the composition of the materials instead of a three to one slope, it might be less, uh, they may be able to get a bit more of a reduction. We do require the involvement of a shoreline, a qualified shoreline or coastal engineer for protection measures to identify uh, the extent of the hazard and, and also to design any kind of shoreline walls to ensure that they are going to be serving the purpose that they are designed for. Uh, to determine the limits of development, a geotechnical study may also be needed to establish the limit of the stable top of slope. And typically, shoreline engineers work together with a geotechnical engineer to determine the overall extent of the hazard on individual lots. And uh, we, we do promote the stabilization of slopes uh, where appropriate to slow uh, and important to note, not stop erosion using using natural materials and vegetation and wherever possible. Uh, it, there's a number of places in which uh, our mapping and information is used on our mapping layers for, for regulatory purposes used in official plan and zoning bylaw maps, real estate lawyer inquiries, insurance investigation uh, for planning and permit approvals, emergency preparedness planning and assessing risk levels for asset management purposes. And that's stuff all for shorelines. Okay, well, thank you both for your presentations. Um, questions by board members? Any, any questions or comments? Uh, Miriam? Thank you, uh, two, two questions. Uh, uh, first one short, is the report the one by Susan? It is, yeah. Okay, um, and um, I'm curious, when a someone a property owner wishes to address their shoreline um is there any uh, a regulation or requirement or uh, do you anticipate any changes with regards to the adjacent properties because if you, sometimes you just can't do yours because you might aggravate the adjacent property or you need to rely on work there mm -hmm. in order to stabilize yours. Is that a too big a question? Is that no, no, it's not not too big of a question at all. And certainly when it, it, a permit would be required for any such work, I, I, if you're doing any kind of erosion protection along the shoreline, uh, what we would require them to, to demonstrate is that there is going to be no negative impacts as a result of that that shoreline wall going onto that one one property so it it would be we would leave that to the shoreline engineer that's doing the design of that that proposal and um and also we need to see that they are going to be doing any and all work on their own properties and if they are going to be expanding onto their neighbor's property that we ensure we get the necessary permission from that landowner but it is it is an item through you mr Chair, i just want to add um that's actually one of the recommendations that's been put in this report because it came up at the public meetings um, and it was kind of championed by Councillor Chorley and I think Councillor Beattie. 
that when erosion work, uh, shoreline work is, is proposed, that the neighbors try to work together. And I think there was interest in looking at potentially a facilitation process through the municipality so that when these types of projects are proposed, the neighbors can talk together with the municipality and perhaps ourselves to look at what are the best options um, for that shoreline, like not just jump to protection and armoring, because sometimes the natural solutions are, are pro appropriate and maybe more cost effective. Um, but it's really trying to stress, you know, when you're when you're planning a project within a reach that you look at the reach holistically and, and collaborate with your neighbors to, to try and find the best solution because there are um, certainly cost efficiencies in terms of access and restoring access. Um, you know, by working together, you really realize those cost savings. Okay. okay. Anyone else with any questions? Uh, Willie, yes. Yeah, and uh, through the chair, and thank you very much, Corey and Ken. Um, just looking at some of the pictures and slides brings back uh, memories, as you had referenced, 2017 and 2019, when the lake levels were very high. And the term that you use, lake surge, and uh, uh, especially in Newcastle, and, and you referenced about uh, the amount of, uh, I guess, slope that we're losing each year when the lake level was high, uh, the uh, lake surge undercutting the bluffs. Now, um, in particular, looking at uh, the one area along the lake shore before it crosses over the uh, Stevenson Road, the wood bridge, uh, Lake Shore Road is very close to one of the bluffs and the stabilization, I think, um, one of the neighbors that had the uh, log house, he tried bringing in fill and just dumping it over the side, which uh, I guess is uh, not a uh, not a permissible use. Uh, somebody else had, I think, thrown over bags of leaves in the fall. Um, how do you prevent or slow down? I mean, you mentioned about. Um, using natural material or vegetation. Um, are you looking at vegetation that grows on the slope? Through, through you, Mr. Chair, if, if, if at all feasible, uh, we, we would. Uh, I, I, the area in which you're referring to, Bondhead, that's, uh, that's a pretty significant, very erosive, uh, erosive slope. And I, I, I mean, I can't, uh, outside of the, the Scarborough Bluffs as a, as a solution, I, I'm not sure if there is a if there really is a viable solution, but they you know yeah, through well, Mr. Chair, I, I can add to that, Willie, that um our consultants actually recommended not protecting the bluffs. Um I think in part because it's it would be cost prohibitive, the amount of um infrastructure you would need to, to stop erosion on the bluffs would be in the hundreds of millions. Um, but I think one of the other reasons is that the sediment and the erosion that's occurring at, in Newcastle and Bondhead is actually what's nourishing the West Beach and Port Hope. Um, so if you <laughs> if you stop that natural process, you actually have impacts on other parts of that reach, um, which have implications as well. So. Yeah, well, uh, I know there's that one log house that's, um, um, you know, um, I, I I don't know. Um, I think the owner has it up for sale, the, sec the, uh, the original owner to this owner, but it's just directly to the east of that. I think my more concern is what may happen to Lakeshore Road. And uh, that probably is, for my sake, probably more um, uh, something that I'm more concerned about. And through you, Mr. Chair, um, certainly critical infrastructure would probably be viewed slightly differently than a development application just because it is serving the community. Yeah. Uh, so there may be exceptions where you'd want to protect infrastructure, um, but it might be something that has to go through a class EA process to look at cost benefit and and you know, is it better long term to realign the road? Because that's certainly what they've seen in Chatham Kent, 
Is yeah. Just to, to try and keep fighting the lake is, is very, very expensive, and it was cheaper to, to realign the long term. Right. right. Okay. Thank you very much. Good presentation. Thank you. Any further questions? There being none, can I have a motion to receive the uh, report for information purposes? Miriam, seconder Adam, all in favor? That's carried. Next up, we have applications under the Ontario Regulation uh, 16806. Uh, I have a mover to receive those for information, please. Jones, seconder, seconder Adam. Any questions from those? There's quite a number of them. Willie, yes, do you have a question? Sure. Oh, yeah, the mic down, Willie. Here we are. Yeah, thank you, and through the chair, and uh, uh, certainly a lot of uh, uh, permits issued for that development between the uh, Hope and Clark, that uh, Open Shaw, and that's one that uh, Council Zorda and I had before us at planning. Now, uh, just at the top of that last page, uh, page three, 5313 Den Road, is that in the municipality of Port Hope, or is that Clarington? I'm not too sure. I oh, it should be. It should be. It should. Mr. Chair, should, this this one appears that it should be Clarington. So I I apologize for the error in this regard. No, that's fine. Um, as long as we get the permit money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Anyone else with any further questions? Uh, there being none, all in favor. Thank you. Uh, new business. We have amendments to the GRCA uh, administrative bylaw, and we have staff report attached. And, and did you want to just uh, do a little info on these? Certainly. Um, through you, Mr. Chair, um, the, the we didn't send these out. They were attached. Um, the administrative bylaws. It's a fairly hefty um, document. You would have all gotten a copy of these in your binder. Um, and so what I'm asking is that you print these or you don't have to, but if you choose to print these, they can go into your binders. Um, they will be replacing what is there now. And what the changes that we made were, um, Ganaraska, if some of you may not recall, um, is one of six conservation authorities in the province of Ontario to uh, be rec to be given a uh, agricultural representative and Bruce Butters is our agricultural representative. So the current um, bylaws needed to be updated, which these are here, to reflect that change and recognize that we do have an agricultural rep and to acknowledge the duties that they have um, and the uh, responsibilities that maybe they don't have. For example, the agricultural representative does not uh, vote on anything to do with the financials of the, of the conservation authority. It's because um, the board members here present have a duty to the municipality. They all give a levy, um, whereas the agricultural reference, uh, there is no financial um, input from, from that sector. So it was to replace that, and I did go through um, kind of where we inserted the agricultural rep. Also, there the not for Ontario Not for Profit Act was not referenced in current um, bylaws, so it was simply recognizing where the Ontario Not for Profit. So wherever you see the words um, Ontario Not for Profit, if you wanted to do a search and find on that, um, it would show up. And, and it was just inserted. So Conservation Ontario, all of these updates were through Conservation Ontario. Um, and so they're simply uh, placed in these. Um, I know that um, I had had uh, uh, a question with regards to, did I submit a track um, and change document? And we did not. We just gave you provided and provided the uh, where the changes were. So if there's any questions, but I think they're, it's pretty straightforward. Again, it just has to do with the agricultural representative. Okay, any questions for Linda? Uh, Joan? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, to clarification, or this is online, I take it, is it? Yeah, through you, Mr. Chair. Yes, there is a, re it's also on our website. So we'll, once this is passed, 
It will go on our website as well, but it's on the electronic. Um, I provided a link to on your electronic agenda package. But by requirement under the uh, Conservation Authorities Act changes, there are different documents that have to go on our website under governance. So if you go on our website under the governance tab, you will see the uh, administrative bylaws and this will go on and replace what is there now. Okay, because you mentioned our red binder. Uh... Uh, it's, it's also in your, your um, members binder that we provided that with those to the orientation. Yeah, I gave you that big binder okay, when you good. came in for your with orientation. Those, perfect. That's what I was getting. Yeah, and it has every policy in it um, that okay. makes for good bedtime reading as well. Thank you so much. Miriam, you had a question? Yes, I have a question to you, Mr. Chair. Under the new business, the different items like A, B, C, D, E, they will be dealt with individually or? Yes. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, we're on the first one now. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, anyone else with a question on, on this one? No. Can I get a mover to uh, to amend the administrative bylaws uh, set out within the report then, please? Mover to approve that. Lance, seconded by Vicki. All in favor? That's carried. The so next up, we have the uh, terms of reference, uh, the Ganaraska Recreational Trail strategy. And we have staff report attached. Again, Linda, do you want to speak um, on this one? Pam would be uh, probably better oh. to speak to that. Um, sure. Pam's there. Pam, do you want to speak on this one? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. So the board has been provided with a copy of the terms of reference as part of the package uh, and the staff report. Um, so this is being provided for information. The terms of reference is just uh, a document that's been created that will outline the purpose of the strategy, the roles and responsibilities of uh, the various um, doers under the uh, to create the strategy, uh, some proposed components of what the strategy will contain, and then the timelines of working through the completion of the strategy towards the end of this year. I'm okay. happy to answer any questions that the board may have. Okay. Any questions by anyone? None. Can I have a mover that uh, the board receives the uh, recreational trail strategy terms of reference for information purposes? So, Willie, you'll move. Seconded by Adam. All in favor? That's carried. Next up, we have the uh, 2022 timeline report dealing with Section 28 applications. Thank you, uh, you Mr. Chair. Uh, okay. With respect to with respect to this item as part of a, the commitment to efficient regulatory services, the MNRF and uh, Conservation Ontario have established uh, timelines for the issuance of permits. In uh, the in 2022, the Ganaraska Region Conservation Authority issued 133 permits, and this just indicates the total number of permits that were issued within within the timeline and uh, and outside of that uh, out that of that timeline. So, mostly uh, uh, we're we're pretty good. I think there were just uh, there were just four permits outside of Conservation Ontario's timeline, and there were. Uh, there, there were a couple outside in uh, of the MNRF timeline as well. There could be any number of reasons for this. I know, I know, some of there's one application that won't meet the timeline next year. Only they have the amount of information in; they just don't have the fill yet to receive to complete that permit. So uh, there, there are certain instances in which um, yeah, the timelines may not be met. But we do strive to ensure that permits are issued as quickly as possible. We do endeavor to get. Most, if not all, permits we can out within within a week. Okay. So, okay. Thank you, Ken. Any questions for Ken on this? No. Can I have a mover that we receive uh, Ken's report for information purposes? On please. Vicky, seconded by Joan. All in favor? Let's hear it. And next up, we have the Recreational Users Committee come to reference and Ken. Uh, yes, Pam. Pam, do you want to speak on that? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so again, the board has been provided with uh, the terms of reference uh, for 2023. Uh, every year we take the opportunity ahead of the first RUC meeting, which is in April, to review the terms of reference and make any um, uh, 
additions or clarifications in it to better support the committee and their tasks. Um, and so in the staff report, we've made a list of some of the sections where we did some, um, some additions or just reworded things to provide a bit more clarity and support. Uh, and also we added in a code of conduct as an appendix to the terms of reference uh, using the board of directors code of conduct that just adapted for the, the RUC. And happy to, and then the other important thing to note is that there's no in, uh, change in intent. Um, the, the, in, yeah, it, nothing has been, uh, changed significantly to change the intent of the role of the committee. Okay. Thank you, Pam. Uh, questions for Pam on this one? Miriam, yes? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, when I went online, uh, I actually saw the, uh, the members, the representation, and uh, what struck me was uh, Ontario Nature, which I'm not sure, I, I'm assuming that's sort of a representative with regards to nature and wildlife and everything related. So there's many, many uh, representatives of, you know, whether they're horses or vehicles, walkers, and then one for the wildlife. But could you put that in context for me? Because I, I like, I mean, I just had visions in my head of, you know, mama bear showing up and saying, excuse me. <laughs> but I know that doesn't happen, but how, how do you achieve balance on, on, on the discussions? And do you want to add, try and answer that? Yes, Mr. Chair. Sorry, it was just I missed the last part. How do we achieve balance on the discussions? discussions. Sorry, I missed that part. Um, so one thing is that the Recreational Users Committee, um, it's it's looking at the recreational use within the forest, um, not necessarily the forest itself. However, in the discussions that they have, there is always um, consideration to the ecology of the forest. Uh, so I guess we bring the balance in through the discussions that we have around the table uh, to make sure that ecology is always considered. Um, one of our agenda items that we try to keep consistent is uh, subject matter pertaining to um, the environment. So in the past, we've spoken to uh, how the forest is managed um, from a silvicultural, like how we manage the, the, the trees through uh, thinnings. Uh, we've talked about up and coming invasive species in the forest. Um, so we, we try to bring balance in the topics that are in front of the committee and the, the members around the committee as well. So the staff will kind of help out that, in that regard, I guess, Pam, yeah, to, to do that. Yeah. Okay, does that help, Miriam? Yeah. Any other questions on the report? No, can I have a mover and a second of them that the NRS Conservation Authority approve the updates within the Recreational Youth Committee terms of reference? Mover by Lance, seconder, Mark, you know, second it, yep. All in favor? That's carried. Okay, next up is uh, one that I, I'd asked Linda to put on the agenda for discussion purposes for today's meeting. That's dealing with a, a question period for the public that we, we'd like to entertain. I know within our own municipality, we, we uh, started this will be last term of council and uh, it's it worked. I, I would have been one that would have been dead against it at that time, but since we've had opportunity to use it and uh, had public uh, come forward, it's actually worked out very, very well for us. So I'd ask Linda you know, to put it on the agenda and see what, what the rest of the board members thought as far as implementing it for our board meetings, maybe have a five or a 10 minute uh, question period, perhaps at the, I'd, I'd recommend at the end of our board meetings, and it would be only on agenda items only. So I am, and they'd have to refer to those. So it'd have to be, uh, you know, I, I'd have to watch it a bit as far as, you know, when I'm chairing the meetings, but in the same token, I mean, we have to be respectful for staff and we just want questions answered. I mean, if they have questions. So, so it's, 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 uh, it's my thought to bring it forward. I, I was hoping I could get some comment by board members and see what your thoughts were, whether you'd be in favor or not in favor, maybe give it a trial run for a month or two, see if we like it. And, and if we do, we would make it a permanent fixture on our agenda and uh, go from there. But uh, from my experience, I, I've seen a, 
uh, within the board. I've seen some questions that came from the public that uh, were asked by, well, they may go from one member, of, uh, not just the public, not just the board, but they may go from uh, different members of the staff and so forth, seeing if they get different answers at different times sometimes. So um, I thought this way would maybe stop some of that and they would hear the same answer that the board would hear and hopefully that would allow clarity out in the public. So, so I thought I'd bring it forward. I'll let you guys hopefully give some comment and then if we're in favor, we'll bring it to hopefully to the next board meeting. Margaret, I see you got your hand up. Thanks. Yes. Yeah, so is it the expectation that members of the public would have to pre-register in order to speak at a meeting? Yeah, we could do that. Right? We haven't gone that far yet, but that may be something that we would highly consider that they'd maybe come forward and if they weren't even able to make the meeting that they, we could send a, a question in and, and the chair could read it out, that kind of thing. So uh, we, you know, I'd, I'd ask that you know, Linda and myself would maybe work you know, something out so that it would be I don't want to put any pressure on on staff, especially. So I want staff to just be able to answer questions, much like they do with ourselves. Uh, Vicki, yes. Thank you. So um, can everybody hear me? I'm calling from a different location. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, I, I appreciate um, the thought and I do see value in having questions coming from the public and for transparency and for educational reasons. Um, my concern, there's a few um, concerns that I have. So we do this in, in Port Hope and we have always done it for, for many, for a long time. Um, often the questions can go astray. Um, it can become comments and um, venting and it's not a question. And, and the question that is, when you put the person back on track, they, to, to express it as a question, it's still not really um, positioned as a question. Um, a lot of times as well, it um, the staff has to get back to you because they're put on the spot and they, they don't have an answer at that moment. Um, my concern with the GRCA staff is that they're not in an elected position to, to respond. They didn't sign up to have questions um, in their normal job. Um, so I'm not opposed to it, but I would prefer that the question is vetted first um, and submitted in advance so that staff has the opportunity to answer it um, without being put on the spot. We could do that. And sometimes a question will come up during the meeting and perhaps that question could be sent to Linda directly and then she'd be able to, to weed it out whether it be a question or not. I mean, that may be something we could look at, but... Uh, I don't see a lot of questions coming to us in, in particular uh, as a board. I, I really don't. I mean, our topics are, I think when staff do their presentation, they do a great job. And I think we've, you know, I'll really watch it as a chair to make sure that those questions are questions and not comments and not anything, uh, you know, that's going to be personalized or anything like that. So it has to be a question on the topic of, of our agenda. And I'd ask them to even to refer to that agenda topic. So. Willie, you have your, your hand up. There we go, I'm off mute. Yes, yeah, no, thank you, Chair. And I, I think this is a good idea. Like you said, I mean, as long as it pertains to something that has been on the agenda, there's some good information. In fact, uh, through you to Pam Lancaster, um, I thought this one would, it, is a, an email that was directed to Pam and uh, to Councillor Zwart, myself. Um, uh, Ken is the response back was with Ken and uh, Linda and Ed. And this was regarding the and Pam. I'll refresh your memory from Dan regarding hunting, and I think that uh, we we talked about opening it up in May. Uh, and this is talking about the uh, Southwest Forest, the Ganarafka Road. And I thought your response was very good, Pam. I think, um, um, and I'll let you speak to it. The only thing that I would have maybe put out, I think um, in your response, um, we did say that it would be, hunting would be allowed to occur ahead of May 1st, uh, but I, the date should be, 
and to be specific, April 25th, is that correct? And motorized vehicles. So if I could get you to respond to that, but I think that's good information that, you know, a question was asked and it was shared amongst a small group, but I think it probably should be, you know, um, uh, the board should know. Okay. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm just going to respond to you. I'm just going to, all I want to say about that, thank you very much. I'm going to let Pam respond to the dates. That is the type of thing that staff prefer is the questions in advance because right. that allows us to sit down as staff and formulate a response rather than being put on the spot um, where we can't speak to one another who needs to speak to because very often it involves more than one staff. Um, so, and then if, and yeah. then not being criticized for not being able to answer a question at the meeting on the spot. So that's where we encourage people to email us, pick up the phone, call us so we can answer those types of questions. But in answer to your specific about the April 25th date, um, perhaps Pam could, could speak to that. Sure, thank you, William. It is a good example and through Mr. Chair. Um, and to re reiterate what Linda just said, uh, our staff works as a team. So, you know, it, we don't, not any one of us has the full answer. Um, so what this example is about is we had a user who emailed, I believe it started with Ed and it, it made its way uh, through to me regarding hunting uh, and the concern that turkey season starts on April 25th um, and May 1st, we were opening, um, you know, standard opening for speed. And so there was um, concern uh, that when we open May 1st, that that's when hunting can happen also. And of course, then there's more time in the forest. Uh, and all it was was just a little bit of um, just, I don't want to say misinformation, but so much happening at once. So just clarifying that hunting is permitted to occur year round in the forest based on provincial guidelines of what's open and not. Um, and so that hunting would still be allowed before May 1st, but in that area of the forest in particular, uh, right now it's on our mapping system showing as not accessible, but it will be. Uh, so the email just reiterated that nothing's changed and that staff would make sure that those access points were accessible ahead of the turkey hunting season. Um, without the email in front of me, it was way more eloquent than that <laughs> when I replied. Um, the, the inquirer was satisfied with that answer. Um, so that is an example. Yeah, no, and I certainly agree. I mean, you handled that very well. I mean, rather than, um, let's say, being dropped on at a meeting and then you have to come up with a response and the response was very good. And I think it was received very well. So thank you very much for that. But I thought the board should know in general because again, the uh, distribution was to Councilor Zord and myself and uh, a certain staff members. Sure. But I thought the board should know. Thank and, you. And, and the last thing we want to do is have staff uh, put out answers that they're not comfortable. I mean, if we have to defer them to the next meeting, we to defer them to the next meeting. I mean, that's not that that's not the point of the question period. The question period is only the the thought behind the question period is to have the public be able to come ask questions because right now some of them get angered that they can't and they don't feel that you know that that's that that's right for them and they would really appreciate if they have that opportunity. So. So it's just a thought. I, I don't know. I'd like other board members input if they would. Joan, yes? Yeah, I think it's a good idea. And I, I think it's something at Alton Haldeman that we're going to be trying to implement. Um, the uh, public want to be able to come and ask questions. And I think your idea at the start of this is that um, you give kind of, if you like, the rules on yes. um, how this will go. And I mean, um, you certainly, I wouldn't expect a staff member to know the answer. So it could be an agenda item uh, deferred to the next uh, agenda if it can't be answered. Sure. And if it's specific, I mean, if you give them their march orders before they start, then, you know, they would uh, know what's expected of them. And I think it, 
keeps um, and keeps it in the uh, sense of being open and transparent. Okay, thank you, Joan. Now, uh, Miriam, your thoughts? Yes, well, I, uh, first, a, que a question of clarification. Um, at your municipality, are the questions after or before a vote on an item, or is there just a general Q&A um, session that happens? Our, question, our questions actually come up at the beginning, and it would be a little more awkward, I think, for the GRC, because we have so few items. I mean, right. At your municipality, you've got a lot of different uh, departments and so forth. So we have, we have them at the beginning, and, and they're allowed to ask questions on any agenda item. And if we, and if, if it's gonna be brought forward at, at, uh, when the item comes forward, like uh, stuff, there may be a staff report that, that's gonna to refer to that. So we'll just say that, that you know, you'll hear it within the staff report. Here, you may already hear the staff report, that question might disappear and that person may not wish that, you know, there may not be a need to ask a question. Uh, so I will say, because uh, I have a few comments just sure. uh, on, on the idea, and uh, generally in support, I think one of the important items is that the chair is comfortable with it, mm -hmm. <laughs> so that you can yeah. control, and uh, like uh, the member has pointed out, that for staff, it, uh, it can, the answer could be deferred. Yes. Right. Yes. So it's like we'll get back to you on that, and it might be of general interest. But I, I was curious. I didn't know about the hunting rules, so I was like, oh. I I didn't know that. <laughs> so I mean, just as an example. Um, so I, I firmly believe that the chair is comfortable. It's a, at the discretion of the chair, putting a time limit on it. Um, I, and a question I, I have is please um uh remind me how far in advance of uh of a meeting, of a board meeting, does a present uh, a delegation have to sign up? Like is the agenda published? And then someone might say, "Oh, I want to speak to that," because that can, that can affect um, the, the uh, formatting. Through you, Mr. Chair, um, delegations must register ten days in advance and have their presentation due the Friday at noon prior to the meeting. The meeting does not go online until um, until the Friday. So, no, the delegations are normally not aimed right at something that's happening at the meeting. Okay, so that, that might be something in the pilot project is to work out that if we're getting a certain number of questions that perhaps there needs to be a deadline maybe a few days after the publishing of the agenda. But I, I mean, just, just I'm just trying to think of the question. So generally I'm supportive of the idea of having the question period. I think the, um, uh, the, the discretion of the chair and, and with regards to how many questions, um, I think I think you're quite capable. <laughs> sure. Do my best. <laughs> so no, I think that would be um, that would be helpful. And, and I think we could try it as a trial. If it doesn't work, we just stop it, right? I mean, you don't have to continue on. It's just something that you could try as a trial. Vicky, yes. And Lance was and, and Lance. Um, I would I would like to propose that rather than making a decision today, that we do. Um, refer this to the staff at the GRCA with some parameters on what they are comfortable with so that we're not making this up as we're going along, such as um, they, it must be in the form of a question, it must be items on the agenda, um, they do have the opportunity to defer this so that um, it's very clear and that as a board we, we can accept or modify what staff brings forward to us. Um, I'm not prepared to vote on this today without knowing all the conditions and parameters of this decision. Okay. I got Lance and I'll come back to you. Lance, yes. Thank you very much through you, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to thank everyone for the presentations today. Um, as always, just very professional and well-organized. So thanks for that. Um, I kind of echo the same sentiments as Vicki. Um, I'm in favor of it. I think it is a good idea. Um, and then if we can, just to kind of circle back to the same points everyone else is making, if we could uh, try to vet this as best as possible and to be able to um, have the opportunity that we can, you know, if answers are not available, um, to be able to provide it at a later time. Um, and with obviously the onus of not putting undue um, additional work for the staff 
And as well, the fact that if we choose to introduce this, um, we have the opportunity that if we find that it's not working or effective, we can walk away from it. That's it. Thank you. Absolutely. Miriam? Uh, yes, so just further to the information uh, of a question that was posed to a member and then staff were involved, uh, specifically the, the hunting question. I'm wondering if in your review, if the staff review, if, uh, if there are questions that may be posed uh, to only certain members of, of, of the board, but if someone could decide whether executive decision, oh, you know what, everybody should know about this. This, this might be information that would be useful. How is that shared? And could this be part of, uh, of information officially so that all of us are aware? I didn't know there was hunting in the forest. It's a multi-use for you, Mr. Chair. It is a multi-use forest. It's We've always allowed yeah. <laughs> not near, not near the school groups. Okay. Obviously. <laughs> um, there is there is a no hunting zone around where the schools. Um, and then they must abide, they have to get their licenses and, and abide by all the hunting regulations. Just an example, right? Yeah. Oh. It, <laughs> never thought of it. it yeah. <laughs> Well, why don't you let us, uh, we could work on it and then I'll work on it with Linda a bit and, and, and staff and so forth. And we'll come back with a report for the next board meeting and, and have everyone take a look at it. And, and uh, maybe when, once you get your package, maybe maybe give us, if you have any questions or comments at that time before we even get to the board meeting, would you please send them to myself or Linda? And then we could, you know, maybe if we have to make some changes, we'll make some changes and so forth. But at least we'll, you know, it'll give us a start and we'll go from there. I don't see it being any different than us having a board meeting with another member, basically, uh, being able to ask questions. So that's the way I look at it. Um, thank you, so good, Mr. Chair. Um, it, actually, I just wanted to ask a question of this staff. Are you all comfortable with us asking you questions about your staff reports? Because basically, about if we're as long as we are making sure that it is about whatever is on the agenda just a public person might have a different perspective than what we had, as long as you guys are all comfortable with that, it shouldn't really make much of a difference who it's coming from. Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, obviously, yes, staff are yeah. quite comfortable. Um, the Board of Directors are governed the Ganaraska Region Conservation Authority. Mm -hmm. I will speak on behalf of the staff that we are not comfortable with the members of the public. This is a board decision. Um, we are not, there will be some anxiety. Maybe if the questions were, were submitted in advance, um, but it's just um, such as we don't allow uh, chat back on our social media anymore because some of the comments people make about staff and people make, um, so it's now we don't allow comments back. It's you, um, we don't allow chat now in, in these um, meetings because the first meeting we had, we allowed chat and the members of the public were in there um, very disrespectful to Not staff. On task. Yeah. And um, so we've now turned the, the chat off of, of these meetings. But um, again, it is a board decision. We're always comfortable in asking the boards or answering the board's questions. And we're always comfortable when a member of the public calls and if we say, you know, um, we'll call you back and then we, we speak and then we call them back, um, you know, as long as we're not asked to, to be doing reports on every single question. And, um, but, but I will be, there, there is a bit of anxiety that we've, um, since Chair brought it up, we have discussed it quite broadly <laughs> as staff um, because we feel that the questions would not go to to the board, they would be coming to staff. I understand that the municipalities, members of the public want to be able to ask their elected officials questions, mm -hmm. um, but we're not the elected officials here and we feel the questions would be coming to staff. But again, um, you know, uh, if, if it is, if the board decides it's referred to staff, we'll do up a, a, uh, a, a report and bring it back. But um, just those are the staffs we're, Again, comfortable in asking, answering the boards here. Of course, you are you govern the authority. You should be able to, you should be able to ask a question about anything on the agenda and anything off the agenda, um, and then we would get back to you because, as as I say, you you do govern the Ganaraska Region Conservation Authority. Uh, just for clarity, Linda, uh, at our municipality, our staff 
answer 100% of the questions that come from the public. Yeah. It's oh, not, yeah. The, 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 the uh, politicians so do not, staff, yeah. yeah, it goes to whichever staff person needs to go to. But we don't get very many. I, I'll be honest, we got a few at the beginning, and then I don't think we've had any now for the last three months since budget time. So, I mean, once budget's over, they kind of disappear. I, I presume unless something major comes up, I don't get them. But we've been doing it for, uh, as Vicky was saying, we've been doing it. And we and so we always have a question period at the end for anybody from the media, if they'd like to, or anybody from uh, from the, the audience. And uh, we, we get questions and it's the exact same thing where they ask uh, they ask us, they ask the chair, and then uh, we defer usually to uh, one of the staff to answer the question, which would be the same question that they'd answer us if we were just to ask you the same type of deal. So um, I just wanted to see if you guys were comfortable with that in a public you know, left before I make a decision on what I want to do. Sure. So thank you. Sure. And we have staff here. I, I've been on the board for, as you, as you all know, a number of years. And, and I can tell you the staff here answer questions and do presentations uh, you saw today very professionally. Mm -hmm. And I've never seen them where they haven't been able to answer a question to any board member at, at any time. So I mean, they do a great job here. And uh, to you, Mr. Chair, I, I think uh, you're comfortable with it, and I think it's um, more and more acceptable now. And uh, point of order, uh, absolutely. We would. I know if we ask things that aren't on the agenda, that's what we hear. So um, I think you're. Uh, you know. Um, you know how this can be successful. Yeah, as I say, they have to refer to to what. We want to see from the agenda. So, I mean, if they can't do that, then the question doesn't get asked as far as I'm concerned. Yes, Anyhow, thank you for your input, and we will bring something back at the next board meeting, uh, and I will do my best to convince staff that this is maybe not such a bad thing. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, so, thank you very much for that. Uh, up next, we have, uh, I'm going to go to other business, and, and this is just to, to let you know that our next board meeting will be at 4 o'clock instead of 2, and they're going to be from 4 o'clock from here on, and it'll still be the third Thursday of the month, so we are going to make that change. Mr. Chair, if we could just uh, mention that there is going to be a um, public uh, consultation about the Wilmot uh, Graham. Uh, Cord, did you want to speak yeah, to that? Uh, through you, Mr. Monday? Chair. Um, this is maybe most applicable to uh, um, Councillor Wu and, and Councillor Zwart. Just we have the uh, Public Information Center for the Wilmot and Graham Creek floodplain mapping project. Um, we have our project page up on our website to view the, the draft mapping, but the actual meeting is going to be in Newcastle at the community hall from six to eight on Monday. So a mail out's gone out from Clarington. Um, but if you know of anyone who would be interested in attending, please feel free to share that information. Okay, good. Okay, so the last part of this agenda uh, is... Excuse uh, me, um, Mr. Chair. We were yes. just discussing, when you asked about the question period, did you put a motion on the floor? I, I didn't. Put, right now, it was just to present. It was oh, just to get him. Because we're going to bring, we're gonna bring up forward at the next meeting. What, and then hopefully the following meeting will go into question period if we can get, get approval. Okay, can I have a motion to adjourn this meeting? And we do have a source uh, protection authority meeting to follow. So motion to adjourn this meeting, Miriam and Adam, we're now adjourned from this meeting and we will go to our next meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Or just if we just come and sit. Well, we've done the land. Do no, you don't have to do the land acknowledgement. It's right here. This is we have got the wrong agenda. There's oh. another agenda packing it up. Yeah. Sorry about that. I haven't got my glasses, my reading glasses here today, so I <laughs> holding the pages put away. Okay, so we'll call our meeting to order. Is there any disclosure of community interest in this meeting? Right. This is our uh, drinking water source protection meeting. Anyone? There being none. We'll now go down to all the way down to new business, and we have a submission of the 2022 annual progress report. 
And it's again a Raska source protection plan to the, and it's going to be sent to the, the MECP. And uh, Jessica, do you want to speak on this or? Excuse me, Mr. Chair, that we need the minutes of the last meeting. Did you just do the minutes of the last meeting or did I miss the minutes? Oh, I'm sorry. No, that's fine. Well, you didn't have my glass. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> problem. We'll step back. We got to go back to the minutes of the last meeting, and that's way back in March 18, 2022. Can I have a mover to approve those minutes presented? Please. Someone. I know nobody. Mark, Mark might have been there. Mark, you were there. Yes. And Vicki might have been there. <laughs> you know, second. All in favor. That's I don't think you have to be there anyways. Just no, I know you don't. I disapprove. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I already read about the new business, and Jessica's here to, to give us a, a briefing on, on the report thing. Who are you, Mr. Chair? You have to oh. speak up loud because you've got Who are you, Mr. Chair? And Corey may add if you like. You know, so this annual report is basically a progress report on the implementation of the implementation bodies, the ministries. So our source water protection plan has the policies and outlines the threats. And um, when this plan was established, basically it also says that the ministries have a task to come up with the policies which then are being implemented. And we have the chance then to report on the progress on it. That's basically what that progress report is. Okay, so any questions for, for Jessica? Anyone? No? The report. On the report. And... Yeah. Um, my apologies. I didn't see that on the agenda. I have a question though. Um, any new concerns coming towards us? Is that, is that a fair question? That is a yeah. fair question. And Pam Lancaster, she is still our Mali uh, Oak, and she is working on all the new stuff because you know there was a um a trigger every five years. The resource project protection plan has to be renewed, and this time it came from the uh, Ministry of Environment, but that is not being recorded in 2022. This will be next year. Okay. Okay, does that help? Well, I, I'm wondering if we have some new sort of incoming concerns that uh, it's uh, more. I don't think and nothing's it's really changed. Change. Oh, that yeah. sort of thing. Everything is being taken care of. That's not mine. Mean. Just to let you know, Vance is gone too. Oh, you know. okay. No. So you have to take him off the screen. Okay. Okay, anybody else with any questions or comments dealing with the report? There being none, can I have a mover to, I guess we need to approve this mm -hmm. report. So mover to approve the report as presented. Mover please, Adam, second and Mark. All in favor, Carrie. And we need a mover to adjourn the meeting, please. Adam, Willie, you'll second and we're done. <laughs> Thank you everyone and we'll see you at four o'clock. A month from now. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Great job. Oh, okay. yeah, just, can I just stop the report? Just stop the report. I can't see. Oh, is it right there? <laughs> it's so far back, then. You're going to have to move it back up now. <laughs>